may not boldly speak out. But as you all know, we won our election by scoring against the devil themselves, so we can speak out. Let us send this note of warning to all in PDP and are part of the leadership of the party at whatever level. That this PDP local government leadership will mark the end of the party if Damago Tam pass with the original agreed list of caretaker committee members for River State and other 10 states. Gentlemen, what Mr. Damago is doing to PDP is worse than what Alimo the Sheriff did or intended to do. Presently, in all the states where PDP is not the governor, Damago has already concluded arrangement to hand the party leadership to APC. In the specific case of River State, the caretaker committee members from Damagun's office are LUGA chairmen produced by former River State House of Assembly members who, as we all know, have lost their seats following their defection to APC. They have formally left the PDP and Damagun is taking a list from them to announce. Gentlemen, please try and imagine what could have led to the national chairman of a party discussing issues of party leadership with people who are not members of that party. Imagine how the discussion of how to collect a list for non-party members were conducted and imagine the terms and conditions of that entire episode. Now I begin to wonder why despite all political crises in River State, our acting national chairman has maintained absolute silence. He did not intervene, he did not lead his executive to storm rivers at a time our party-led government came under unconstitutional assault. He stood by and watched until President Bola Ahmed Tinubu from another political party intervened. Gentlemen, it is PDP we are talking about, the largest political party in Africa, a solid institution different from all the, all the other one-man political parties in Nigeria. Gentlemen, the reason a political party exists is to campaign for power, win power and control power. Therefore, how can some of our former members working with APC government claim that they are in PDP but mobilizing support for another political party? How can Damagu hear this statement while claiming to be our national chairman, and he's still in bed with these men and their co-travelers. There could be only one reason, and that is, Damago is the driver of this bus these co-travelers are riding in at the expense of the suffering masses. You cannot be working for those interested in the downfall of PDP and yet claim to love PDP. It is not just possible. Under Damago, PDP lost the entire Southeast, that he thought was a comfort zone of the party. PDP controls only Enugu state, which he literally snatched from the jaw of a lion. We lost Benue, Abia, and Sokoto. The PDP leadership kept moved, while PDP state and federal lawmakers lost their seat at the tribunal and court of appeal on grounds that we are obviously untenable, which would have been obtained by the Supreme Court. If the party has spoken up and raised the necessary alarm, all our colleagues in Imo and Plateau state particularly would have been with us in the assembly today. So, gentlemen, it is our call on Damagu to immediately step aside that the party, so that the party can midwife a process and hand over to someone from North Central in line with the provisions of our party constitution. It is also our call to the leaders of our party from the North Central, the governor of Plateau State, His Excellency Caleb, His Excellency David Mack, His Excellency Abubakar Bukola Saraki, Senator Abba Moro, his Excellency Babangida Aliyo to rise up now and save the soul of the party. The enemies have gotten to the last bridge and we must defend it and push them back. No reasonable person can boast with his membership of a political party where the activities of that party are decided in the National Secretariat of another party. PDP is bigger than every one of us. It is an institution, a beautiful bride that resonates with Nigerians whenever, whenever we get it right. The only authentic party that is democratic in Africa. The ruling party has the last nine years presented their first 11 and their second 11. And Nigerians have tested it and now without that the PDP is the true democratic party for the people. As the country is today drifting, every reasonable Nigerian should be truly worried that the PDP is facing such attack from within its rank and in particular its leadership. It should even worry the ruling party that there is no credible opposition to keep them on their toes and ensure their performance except they do not want to perform. So the death of PDP will not be victory for any person who claims to love Nigeria. Gentlemen, the servitude of these invaders in the leadership of the PDP to the ruling APC has made them keep quiet to all sorts of things happening in the party. They keep quiet because the atrocities are being committed by their cohorts and allies who they deceive that they possess the power to destroy the PDP. 
PDP is too big to be sold, and PDP cannot be sold. Soon they will find out and would have, they, they, soon they would have found out and would have only ended up wasting their uh, uh, paymaster's money. Let us call on Damagu once again. Damagu, 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 how many times did we call you? Voices have risen from the National Assembly to speak out and stop you. You have a chance to resign immediately, leave or be embarrassed out of the party. At least, 60 of us in the PDP in the National Assembly will severe all relationship with your leadership until you leave office. At the scheduled National Executive Committee meeting, if Damago by any maneuvering, however, conducted, remains in office with the help of his APC friend at the end of the day, the party is now heading to the final slaughtership. We have been briefed of plans and ongoing mobilization and lobbying of some PDP next members by APC loyalists masquerading as PDP, PDP members to issue a kangaroo vote of confidence on Damagu to enable APC continue their hold on the party via their agents who claim to be PDP while on APC mission to destroy PDP. Instead of allowing North Central produce the acting chairman as required by the PDP constitution pending the conduct of a convention or resolution of pending litigation, the pro-APC APC forces within working with Damagu want to affirm Damagu as chairman of the party at the next meeting to help them set the party on the path of irredeemable, irredeemable condemnation. If IU is in court, why not allow an acting chairman for his own to act pending resolution of all the issues since the tenure of office zone to them is running and cannot be reversed? In case Damagu does not remember, we will remind him now. President Bola Meitubu was in opposition until 2015. If he was trading his party for forage, he would not have been where he is today. So thinking that Aswaj is even impressed by this mercantilist agenda of trading of the PDP would be infantile thinking. Yeah, Aswaj could be benefiting now, but he truly sees you people as cheap political betrayers and merchants who hold no values there and have nothing to offer. Could you not have respectfully worked for Aswaj without losing your respect? Gentlemen and fellow Nigerians, who have wondered why Damagu kept quiet, why the 27 members of the River State House of Assembly elected on the platform of the party, left the party. He kept quiet while they were threatening to impeach a governor in his own party. Nigerians will be shocked to hear that Damagu was consulted and he was fully aware of all this plot. That is why he refused to lead the party, the party to resist. If Kwan Kwaso could lead PDP and build their party and win Kano State with several federal and state lawmakers, and Peter B also left PDP to grow Labour Party to win Abia, as well as several federal and state lawmakers, then Damagu and his friends working for APC could as well leave PDP and go ahead to support APC boldly since their spirit is already out of PDP. But their attempt and maturation to kill PDP is totally unacceptable and it is the reason we have stepped up to save the party. So as a last ditch effort of rescuing the party and for peace in the PDP, we demand the following. One, immediate resignation of Elma Iliyo Damagu as acting national chairman of PDP for anti-party activities and allow North Central produce the acting chairman as clearly stated in the PDP constitution or watch us reconsider our membership of the party in the months ahead if the writing is not done. Or removal of Omar Damagun by the neck of the party with further sanctions against him for anti-party activities. Three, that the neck of the party should ensure that the list of party caretaker committees in River State and all the other 10 states tampered by Damagu and his APC friends are reversed and announced as originally agreed. That is by extension of the tenets of the outgoing leadership. That the move to use serving APC members in Rivers and 10 other states to lead our party caretaker as states, LUGA and World Level is the highest act of political provocation and impunity that we are going to fight with everything in us. PDP cannot be handed over to APC. APC officers cannot emerge as our party officials in rivers or any of the 10 states with alleged imposition of their interests. Let the world know that why they are hell-bent on imposing APC officials as our party caretaker members is to fulfill a planned bigger plot, which will see so-called PDP members who in reality are APC the campaign in mass into APC as PDP officials, which will see the imposed executive of our party in over 11 states, including Rivers, joining on APC on their state date, just embarrass our party. Hence,
against our resistance that will fight with everything in us and to any length to resist that plan. God save the PDP. Just imagine imposing card carrying members of APC in the entire PDP structures in rivers and 10 states in the country. God, how did we get here? That neck of PDP should review the sources of generating finances for the party to pay its national secretary staff and to discharge all other responsibilities of the party and also to investigate the allegation that pro-APC supporters are funding the present PDP of today. This is the height of political treason. The PDP neck should set up a committee to investigate all continuing art of anti-party activities from 2023 and method appropriate sanctions which will serve as deterrent and also encourage the cleansing of the party. What executive of our party where people have involved in anti-party activities are still involved like Cross River State, River State, Benue, Abia, Ondo, Kogi, Imo, Edo should immediately announce the expulsion of all those involved without fear or favor. This must be done immediately. Any executive that cannot do this should be removed by members in those wards and new officers who have the courage to enforce the provision of our party constitution constituted to do the need for. That a credible party leader from North Central be confirmed chairman of the party in line with the zoning formula as enshrined in the constitution at the upcoming next meeting of our party. Where these demands are not met, we, the opposition lawmaker coalition from PDP in the National Assembly, will be left with no other option but suspend participating in party activities and seek new political relationship where decision in that party will not be taken in the secretariat of another political party. But this is the last of the last part where every other reasonable effort at resolution of this issue fails. PDP is a great party that means well for Nigeria. PDP will emerge from this challenge stronger and will one day in the near future take over the government of Nigeria again and return the country to its glorious days. Also, in a related development, we have received credible intelligence of a plot to use the Federal High Court. And I repeat, we have now received credible intelligence of a plot to use the Federal High Court to secure a secret expert order that will attempt to legalize the illegal extension of the about to expire tenure of LUJ chairman in River State, which was carried out by the former members of the State Assembly who lost legitimacy as lawmakers the very moment they come to APC, knowing fully well that there was no crisis in PDP. Hence, their seat as lawmakers became vacant immediately. The remaining legitimate members declared the seat vacant. We are raising this alarm in view of the legitimacy of in view of the legitimacy of the desperate the illegitimacy of the desperate move, which, if not halted, can lead to anarchy and collapse of constitutional governance. We want to call on the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court and also Justice Omotoshe and all the eminent judges to be aware of this plot, that those behind it are already celebrating that the expert order is in their pocket, awaiting release to the media, even when the case has not been heard. To our respected Chief Judge, we are compared to publicly bring this shocking development to your attention for the interest of justice and preservation of the image of our nation's democracy and judiciary. Few days ago, we received credible intelligence that a suit filed on behalf of the Abuja-based former House of Assembly members in River State, whose seats have been declared vacant, over their decapment to APC, even when there was no crisis in PDP, but still parading as lawmakers and changing laws in the middle of the night from the corner of their hotel room in Abuja and Emoha LGA, where they are gathered and made to make legislative announcements without the legitimacy or due process to do so. Our dear Chief Judge, Honorable Justice J.T. Soho, we wish to inform you that this strange suit, which our intelligence has shown, is alleged to have been filed at the Registrar of the Federal High Court, will be assigned to Justice Omotosho, who is expected to issue an injunction legalizing the illegal amendment and extension of tenure of the about to expire LUGA chairman in Rivers in order to keep them in office with their tenure extended without an election is a great aberration and risk capable of tarnishing the image of the judiciary if this is allowed to happen. We are lawmakers, we are lawmakers, and we have great respect and confidence in the Federal High Court to nip this ugly alleged development in the board, if still active. We are confident that these men of unimaginable desperation, touting the name of respected judges in their Biapala gossip, are out to ruin the respected name of judges of the Federal High Court, 
and the court must be careful in handling such obnoxious applications which are targeted to carry out a judicial and legislative coup against democracy by extending tenure of local government chairman whose tenure are about to expire without allowing constitutional, democratic, and electoral process to take place. The desperation of these Abuja-based former lawmakers and their penchant for any action that is illegitimate prepared us not to take the intelligence lightly, hence the need to draw the attention of our respected judges to this alleged imagined development that must be crushed at all costs for the sake of the image of our judiciary. For those who do not know both in the judiciary and the entire country, let us state it clearly. The cruise of the matter is that the former members of the River State House of Assembly whose seats were declared vacant came out from hiding one day and announced illegal amendment to the River State LGA laws unilaterally without the legitimacy carried and without legitimacy and carried out an extension of tenure of the LGA chairman which is about to expire and said they can remain in office as long as required without any tenure again or election process as the basis for holding such office. This is a legislative coup, legislative rascality, and insertion of the process for constitutional democracy. The law was dead on arrival as it was made by men and women unknown to law. It was made by people without the legitimacy to make such law, and hence their claim of overriding the governor's assent was the height of their legislative rascality and political hallucination. Now, sensing that the illegal amendment is unenforceable, these men and their agents decided to drag the judiciary into this madness with the alleged application seeking to issue them expert for unenforceable to be enforced, including an order to seize and hijack the LUG allocation due to rivers and be sharing it from the comfort of their hotel room in Abuja and Emoha. This could lead to anarchy. This is a grand assault on democracy and rule of law. And if our judiciary is ever dragged into this, our nation, our nation would have been taken back to the dark ages. Hence, our call on the National Judicial Council, the Federal High Court, the Nigerian Bar Association, and all relevant authorities to ensure that our courts are not used to carry out the infamous alleged act of using an expert order to legalize the illegal tenure extension for local government chairmen in River State whose tenure are about to expire. We are also calling on the federal government to be at alert, especially judiciary, as we have been informed about another prayer in the suit seeking to order the Accountant General of the Federation and the Federal Ministry of Finance to seize the legitimate local government allocation of River State, deny the rivers people access to their constitutional fund, including LUGA workers and primary school teachers who will not be paid while the money should be sent to the LUGA chairman whose tenure will elapse in the coming days, who in their retirement will be sharing the allocation of the people based on the illegal law that claim to have extended their tenure without any election producing them. Haba. Even in Mubuti Seseko, Congo, and Kruzusa's Burundi, people could never have imagined this kind of recklessness. We wish to state clearly that the opposition lawmakers will not take lightly any move to extend the tenure of their bar to expire LUGA chairman under any guise or scheme. You cannot be in office and your tenure is expiring in a few days and somebody makes a law from a one bedroom in Abuja and Emoha extending you to be in office without an election. That is madness. The opposition is calling on the president, as a Nedeko bred Democrat, to call those pursuing their selfish, greedy ambition, but illegally using his name to carry out constitutional destabilization activities in reverse to order. They have breached the peace accord and carried on as though they are the only ones that have monopoly for crisis and violence. They have no atom of respect for the president. The allocation of river state cannot be stolen using an expert order. Neither can the LGA chairman whose tenure have expired be allowed a second chance in office under any circumstances without going through an electoral process. That the people of River State have maintained peace in the face of all this evil provocation, and that should rather be that should be appreciated and not something that should be taken for granted. Let all men of goodwill stand up and join us in saying enough is enough. The legislative recklessness in River State must end now and the attempt to drag the Federal High Court into granting expert order to seize the reverse LUG allocation and stamp the illegal extension of tenure of our bar to expire LUG chairman by a group of people impersonating as lawmakers after their seats have been declared vacant must end now. Thank you and God bless. I will invite my colleagues to make their brief comments. Please, Mr. Okay.
Thank you very much, gentlemen of the press. What we have presented before you this morning should be very worrisome. Worrisome to the extent that this country is at risk, at risk of being mocked at risk of being isolated in the Committee of Nations. We have a president who has gone everywhere seeking, appealing for investors, appealing for cooperation. There is no investor, honestly so, who would want to invest in a country that does not respect her own laws, left alone the constitution of that country? If our judiciary is so dragged into legalizing illegalities, there is a very huge concern. Mr. President and his advisors, his economic team, should rise up they should say this as a clarion call to save this country, Nigeria. There is always a time for governance and also a time for politics. This is the time for governance and not politics. On the streets of River State, the Rivers people are united behind the governor that they elected. The reverse people are united in rejecting the illegal members of the River State House of Assembly, former. Therefore, it should not be heard, neither should it be seen, that there are persons using authorities of governance to perpetuate illegality in River State. We should also be aware that the peace of this country revolves around the peace of every entity therefrom. If for whatever gains, for whatever reason, people are encouraged to mess with the peace of River State, I do not know how that will affect the other components. As members of the People's Democratic Party. There are precedents, and that is what we have stated. Damagun should not continue. He should cede that position to the area that it rightly belongs to. The rains have come too early, but rather than raise our hands and complain, we will use the rains to water our fields. And the field would be very bounteous. The ruling party should as a matter of necessity, allow dissenting voices so that they can guard them, so that they can encourage them to do better than what they are doing today. We all are aware of the hardship. It knows no color. It knows no party. They should not continue to encourage this bring advantage, this rascality. It is our opinion that Mr. President will do the needful. It is our opinion that the judiciary should also stand up to protect its integrity. 
the National Judicial Council should be alive to its responsibility to discipline whoever wants to bring this respect to that revered arm of government. Good afternoon, gentlemen of the press. As my colleagues have rightly said, we are calling on the governors of the People's Democratic Party because all of us, the lawmakers elected on the platform of PDP, are saying the same thing. Damagu should please exit and allow the North Central to take back their rightful position because it is not going to be extended by the time it expires in the next two years. Secondly, you cannot change the rule of the game in the center of the game or when the game is about to be over. The chairman whose tenure about to expire in Rivers were elected by the people of River State. They were not elected by the courts. And they were elected on terms and they sworn, they were sworn in with a definite term lag, which is three years, I'm sure. So please, we are begging the judiciary not to cause chaos in rivers. The right thing should be done. Thank you, gentlemen of the press. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. Uh, just to add to some of what my colleague have already said, there is no country that practices democracy that can work without a formidable, effective, and efficient opposition. And that is why, as opposition lawmakers coalitions, we are here to revive and ensure that the opposition wake up and stand for its role, for its uh, role to play as an opposition. We cannot continue the way the opposition have been. And um, you will agree with me today that a lot of reformation is taking place by the ruling party. For some of us that are here, that are very progressive in nature, have agreed to some of this reformation, but the timing of this reformation, I think it is not coming to Nigeria with the ease that is expected. For example, the removal of the foil subsidy have put a lot of hardship on Nigeria. Go to all the nooks and crannies, you see our people biting their fingers, even for what to eat. And today we wake up, there's also removal of subsidy on, on, on the uh, electric tariff. Democracy is for the people. We cannot continue without consultation and the right timing of reformations. PDP as an opposition party, we are calling as an opposition lawmakers. That is our role to come up and provide solution. We are not here to lament or to murmur. We are here to provide an alternative. We are here to say that the opposition have to wake up, stand to its role, and play its role as an opposition, and make Nigerians benefit from the dividends of democracy. Thank you. Uh, any question? Yes, we have questions. Sorry, uh, we have to take it one after the other. Please. You have to be brief and go straight to the point. Easy, can we have a question? I don't ask a favor. Okay, uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Lizzie GP. I write for other paper. So, uh, first of all, please look up my microphone. First of all, I would like to know the lawmakers. Okay, lawmakers standing before us, uh, because from the invitation we got, we were told that the opposition coalition of the opposition, and we don't know if all the members standing here are because we've heard you talk about PDP mostly. Is it only PDP lawmakers that are here, or the opposition, the coalition? Here, that's my first question. The second question will be that coalition. The first, the second question will be that are we now seeing a house 
divided against itself. Because if we are talking about PDP or opposition, first of all, we were expecting to see the minority leader here in person of Honorable Kis Lichinda. And uh, Rep Kis Lichinda is nowhere to be found in this, uh, uh, the lawmaker standing here before us. So is it a house divided against itself? Thank you very much. So, how is it? My name is Christiana Eva. Just a follow up to what she said. Is this briefing or the, the scene of the acting BDP chairman about um, River State? Because you keep measuring, and unfortunately, we didn't hear you call any other state where uh, it's practicing illegality. Thank you. Let me ask, um, also beyond this president, now you've alleged that the, the guys who are beneficial of the federal service in the reality do not use the judiciary. I want to approach the court to stop the purported illegality or you will leave it at your level of saying you make sure to use whatever means to counter the activities. That's number one. Number two, we, you, you are aware that um, the former governor of Kaduna State had two consecutive meetings with PDP and XDP and what have you. Now, what would be your reaction to that development? Uh, then lastly, uh, there is a thinking coming from Nigeria that some of you in the opposition, you are beneficiaries of the benevolence of NPCs in the House of Representatives. And that's why we will not be hearing much of opposition voices when it comes to issues concerning Nigeria. But why are you particular when it, is called, if it has come to politics when you are uh, complacent on um, issue of governance? Thank you. Sorry, we have to move the All right, uh, my name is Abdul. I'm just concerned that uh, this is what is happening within a period of time. Did you try to do an internal uh, kind of settlement before just coming to the press? Because coming to the press, I even exposed the Thank you. Okay, Thank you. My name is Kate. I my question is, in an event where the chairman do not resign, what have you decided to do as a president? So, Magic. Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Magic Bakara. My question is that I heard you say this several times that the president should intervene. Does it not call to question of, you know, the PDP as an opposition party no, no, no. that will have to be begging uh, the president who is the head of your party? Uh, no, no, That's question number one. No, and question number two is, is that as legislators, you were silent during the saga of probably allegation of burning down the state house of assembly in the past since when this saga commenced. But suddenly now you found your questions. Is it a question of where your interest lie is where you find us Nigerians as well? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, one, um, I don't think anybody made comment about asking the president to intervene in the internal Crisis. issues that has to do with the PDP. What the issue that was raised here was about those who are trying to undermine the judiciary and create a situation that will lead to constitutional uh, crisis. That was where we now say the president, both the president, the NJC, and other key stakeholders should get uh, involved. And then coming to the first question, there is no division here. Maybe you did not listen carefully. This was a gathering of opposition lawmakers coalition, which is a group that stretches across different political parties. But the people speaking here today are the PDP aspect of it. And because there's a, it's an internal issue that happened in our party. And then talking about internal options, all internal options have been exhausted. These conversations have been ongoing for a very long time. Some of you have been following it. I have been listening to the rhetorics that have been happening across all parts of the country, <clears throat> where people have taken up arms against their own party and saying they will destroy the party. We have appealed to the party leadership over time internally to allow the due process to follow. And what is this due process? The constitution of our party made it uh, expressly clear 
that whenever there's a vacancy, the zone from which the officer originated from will present a replacement to act pending the conduct of a substantive convention. And it's getting to almost one year, and then the deputy chairman has been in office. And not only that, things has gone from bad to worse. And while we're talking about uh, 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 rivers also, it's a place where also our party have come under the biggest internal attack and we have been able to identify that there's internal collaboration with the outsiders who are after our party. And there's also a constitutional violation of people leaving the party upon which they were elected when there was no internal division. And at the same time, even when there's others of court, are now going about making laws in one bedroom and this can lead to breakdown of law and other. More importantly, amending the local government law and saying that somebody that is elected whose tenure have expired can stay in office. You worry every Nigerian. It means that somebody can even propose such a law at the national level. So it's a constitutional issue that we must also address and which is also very important. And also, if he refuses to resign, like we said, we have been discussing and consulting. See, the whole of yesterday night we were having meetings with our members. Legal option is also part of it. These issues have been decided in the past. It's not the first time these issues are coming up. That if he refuses to take that part of honor, and if the NEC refuses at the NEC meeting to take that decisive action, then definitely what will happen is that we'll take the legal option to ensure that we'll get him out of office so that the people of North Central can take back their job and complete the remaining tenure. And also, it's very important to understand that um, we have also tried among ourselves to build stronger unity and that is also working out. People may have some allegiances which may make them not be effective in defending the party they belong to. But some of us here and the over 60 of us, we are committed in doing that. Before we came on board, put ourselves together and started coming out. Most of the issues that have happened in the past, we've also talked about them. Even when the issue of the burning of the House of Assembly also happened, we also talked exactly. about it. And just like he said, he spoke just briefly now about the issue of the electricity tariff. And yesterday, that what we decided was that we understand that the, at the rates the companies are operating, they are not making profit. But we must also consider the fact that there have not been much improvement in the finance of Nigerian people. That most of these things can be implemented in phases. That was our decision yesterday, and of course, we're going to brief on that on a later date also. So we're all standing 100% with Nigerian people, and in the days ahead, we'll continue to push that frontiers of effective opposition and uh, uh, engagement of our people. And uh, like uh, he talked about uh, people visiting people across the country. Yes, there have been conversations across all parts of the country, which involves most of the opposition lawmakers. There's con conversations of rejigging the party. There's conversations of building a broader coalition. There's conversation of mergers. There's different conversations going on, but we cannot speak on that because we have not got into a tangible position where we can talk about those uh, movements across different parts of the country. Thank you. So, sir, please, uh, to wrap it up, we want to know your position on the impeachment of the deputy governor of Well, we just, while we're working in here, we, we got to hear about the impeachment mm -hmm. that happened uh, in the state. So after here, we're going to meet and have a position as a body because we just saw it on TV while we're working in here. So we'll not be able to comment on it now. So, uh, with this, we'll come to the end of it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now continue with our regular programs. Stay tuned. Welcome back from the live telecast. We'll now continue with our regular programs. Stay tuned. Welcome back from the live telecast. We'll now continue with our regular...
every major news story is with many perspective and layered with different levels of impact. Hello. What time did this happen? We will be right there. In the world of sports, Liverpool squandered the opportunity to return to the top of the Premier League as they were held to a draw in another Old Trafford Trentford end for its first home goal. But Liverpool salvaged the draw when Mohamed Salah scored from the spot with six Milaka launched in late on Harry Elliott. And Salah cut. Bonsa, touch for Elliott. Salah, Elliott. Oh, that's a challenge by Juan Bissaka, and it's a Liverpool penalty. They've never. The most important was that we, in decisive moments, first half, and we lost the duels, and our in decision making and in the half spaces, we were not quick enough thinking, and well, we encouraged the team in half time that you have to win those, those duels because it will be decisive. The moment you win those duels, especially if you can then make a change to the far side half space, and then you have greater overload on the back line, and you will create in first half already. Was this the case? So we didn't take advantage from it, but second half we did, and and yeah, um, we needed a moment in the game and to to punish a mistake of Liverpool, but that caught us back in the game. We should have could have been calmer in moments or be clearer in moments. So. But it's fine, you won it up, so so fine. Come outside and still controlling the game, yes. And then we give the ball away. So that's how it is. And then you first have these mistakes happen before and will happen after, um, after today um, as well. So that's not a problem. First, have to use it like Bruno did. <laughs> it was a pretty exceptional finish. Final scoreline 2 2. Um, I'm not over the moon about it. I don't think um, that's the best result I've ever seen. Um, but I'm fine. And. Um, other results, Chelsea played out a 2-0 draw against Sheffield United, while Tottenham Hotspur returned to the top four for the first time since February by beating Nottingham Forest by three goals to one. Liverpool now lies second behind leaders Arsenal on goal difference, with Manchester City a point further back in third place. Still talking football matters, the Nigerian Professional Football League climaxed on March day 29 as Heartland of Oweri trashed Sporting Lagos by three goals to one at Dan Ayam Stadium in Imo State. Elsewhere, Kasana United defeated Enugu Rangers by five goals, four goals to three in a seven-goal thriller, while Quara United played out a one-all draw against Bendel Insurance. Aimba lost by a lone goal to Lobby Stars. Niger Tornadoes trashed Gombe United by five goals to nil, while Sunshine Stars of Akure played out a one-all draw against Bayelsa United. Away from that to the world of basketball where Paul George scored 23 points in the final quarter as he inspired the Los Angeles Clippers to a remarkable 120 to 180 points win over the Cleveland Cavaliers. America's George was in fine form scoring 39 points with 11 rebounds and 7 assists to help his side overturn a 26 point deficit. James Harden contributed 22 points while Ivica Subak, Terran Mann and Norman Powell scored 14 points each. George crowned his performance by sinking the go-ahead shot with seven seconds remaining before making a crucial block to preserve the Clippers' lead just before the buzzer. Austin Reed. How about that? And then Spencer came back to get the rebound. The scooch underneath Jackson Hayes. There he is, Garland. <laughs> Elsewhere, the Dallas Mavericks kept up their late season charge with a third straight victory. A 147 to 136 points overtime win over the Houston Rockets, while the Golden State Warriors defeated the Hooter Jazz by 118 to 110 points, with Clay Thompson scoring 32 points. The Los Angeles Lakers were without LeBron James and suffered a 127 to 117 points loss to the Minnesota Timberwolves, while the Miami Heat stumbled to a 117 to 115 points defeat against the Indiana Pacers, with Tyrese Maxey scoring 52 points for the Philadelphia 76ers as they defeated the San Antonio Spurs 133 to 126 points in double overtime for a fifth straight win. The Phoenix Suns lost 113 to 105 points to the New Orleans Pelicans, while the New York Knicks defeated the Milwaukee Bucks 122 to 109 points. The Boston Celtics defeated the Portland Trail Blazers by 124 to 107 points. 
And wrapping up sports update at this time, in the world of Formula 1, Max Verstappen cruised a comfortable victory in the Japanese Grand Prix, leading teammate Sergio Perez to a Red Bull 1-2. Verstappen took an early race stoppage at Suzuka in a stride as he secured his third victory in four races this season. Red Bull were in a league of their own in a race dominated by tyre strategy. Carlos Sainz passed his teammate Charles Leclerc late on to secure third as Ferrari used different strategies. Albon was sort of aiming towards a space that was closing. Oh, Daniel's come across on Alex Albon. I don't think that was particularly fair from, uh, from Ricardo there. I think he did. And that's all we have on Sports Wrap. Every morning is an opportunity to take your hustle to the next level. Every morning is one day closer to your ambition. So, make every morning count. Cup after cup. Morning after morning. Start strong. Finish strong. Nescafe. There is always more to a story than the screaming headline. The part of a story that is not told casts a shadow. It's like the part of an object that is not reached by light. On TVC News, I'm able to explore the many angles there are to a story, talking to stakeholders, asking the difficult questions, and digging for facts. I believe the viewers are able to make a better decision if they're well informed and understand not just a part, but the complete story. TVC News. First, with breaking news. Every week, Green Angle, in partnership with World Aid, will bring you a documentary series on environmental issues affecting Nigeria's amazing biodiversity, from climate change, air pollution, and wildlife conservation. We will be traveling across Nigeria to give you on the ground report of the issues affecting our environment. It airs every Saturday at 4.30 p.m. only on TVC News. Stay ahead with the biggest news stories. Go beyond the news headlines. Experience impactful investigations. Enjoy resourceful news coverage in real time. TVC News at 7 and TVC News at 10 p.m. Live every day on this channel. TVC News. First with breaking news. And outside Nigeria, millions of people prepare to witness a total solar eclipse across uh, parts of North America. It will begin over the Cook Islands in the Pacific Ocean and then move across Mexico and 13 U.S. states before finishing in Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. NASA will conduct many experiments uh, throughout the cosmic event, including launching rockets into the eclipse shadow and sending research jet planes to track its parts. And that's it on TVC News at 1. Thanks for watching. Kende suffers from indigestion. His twin Taiyi suffers from heartburn. Sometimes it's the other way around, or both. That's why they use Gaviscon Double Action. It soothes within three minutes and lasts for up to four hours. For double relief from heartburn and indigestion, Gaviscon Double Action. Bye, Mom. He's going to play in this weather. Uh -huh. Why did you let him go? He might fall ill. 
And if he doesn't go out for practice, how will he win more trophies? To protect our family from illness-causing germs during the rainy season, we use Dettol soap every day. Dettol with Germ Defense gives you protection. Rainy season brings a lot of germs, and Dettol soap's Germ Defense protects you from up to 100 illness-causing germs. Dettol soap is endorsed by the Nigerian Medical Association. Be Dettol Show. The new Hapik Sachets. It has a thick formula, so all you need is just one sachet for your toilet bowl. It gives 10 times better cleaning and big savings too. Wow, Helen! Sparkling clean toilet with Hapik Sachet. Lagos is the most visited state in Africa as the fifth largest economy on the continent. Covering the state and its government, it's no me feet, it's a busy beat. We go beyond the cutting of tapes to travel in far into the deep. I want to thank the Lagos state government for the healthcare facility to bring stories that cut across all spectrums. A greater Lagos shall be ours. We tell you stories that define our collective well-being as Lagosians. I'm Adidoja Salamadini. I live in Lagos, inside Lagos. Stay ahead with the biggest news stories. Go beyond the news headlines. Experience impactful investigations. Enjoy resourceful news coverage in real time. TVC News at 7 and TVC News at 10 p.m. Live every day on this channel. TVC News. First with breaking news. Have you had a hard time with taxes and understanding tax administration in Lagos State and the complex nature of Nigerian tax law? Do you know what agency or tier of government collects the various types of taxes? Have you ever found yourself asking any of these questions? Join us for your favorite program. The Tax Talk, your infotainment program. At TVC News, wherever the big news story is happening, we're geared up to break it. TVC News, first with breaking news. Wherever you see destruction, it's because God is absent. There is no destruction in God. So who started killing from Genesis? Satan. Jesus exposed him. The thief cometh not, but for to steal to kill and to destroy but i am come that you may have life and have it how much more abundant i prophesy as your amen is coming like thunder whatever is yours receive it now as the best TV station of the year. TVC News breaks into the core of every event as they happen. Following all nationwide big and impactful stories. Without the news from every perspective. Covering every human angle. I am Veronica bringing you the news you would want to watch. Hello there and happy new week. Thank you for joining us. This is Business Nigeria. These are the top stories we are tracking for you at this time. CBN begins sales of dollars to BDCs at 1,000 Naira, 101 uh, to a dollar as FCCPC lords NERC for protecting consumers over new electricity tariff. 
Stocks steady as crude oil cools. Treasury yields hit for months high. Well, on our interview segment today on the show, well, enough burning economic issues in Nigeria at this time. Yes, characterized by the rising cost of living and the hike in electricity tariffs, which is the new one, amongst others. Of course, on the other side of the show, we'll shift our focus to the foreign exchange market. We'll look at the impact of a stable exchange rate to sustaining development. Steps taken by the CBN to check activities of, uh, of course, speculators and all, and of course the roles of the Burundi change operators uh, in the entire Forex market. These and more will be what we'll be talking about today. Of course, we'll touch by the exchange to also bring you up to speed with happenings with regards to shares trading. But some news before we get talking. Central Bank of Nigeria has revealed the exchange rate for Burundi change operators to 1,101 naira per dollar from 1,225 251 and naira to a dollar. This was revealed in a letter addressed to the president of the Association of Burundi Shared Operators of Nigeria, stating that CBN will sell $10,000 to the BDC operators at an exchange rate of 1,101 naira per dollar. According to the CBN, this measure is intended to facilitate access to foreign exchange for legitimate transactions within the retail market and address our retail market demand for eligible invisible transactions. The Apex Bank also outlined the directive for BDCs to sell their acquired forex to eligible end users at a spread not exceeding 1.5% above the purchasing price. And the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, FCCPC, has appealed for robust and vigilant enforcement by Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission towards greater transparency in billing and electricity supply. The acting executive vice chairman of the commission, Dr. Adamo Abdullahi, in a statement in Abuja said, the enforcement will ensure balance to the recent, uh, recently increased tariff for Band A customers. He recommended the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission's 200 million naira fine against the Abuja Electricity Distribution Company. The fine, according to the vice uh, acting chairman is for violating the supplementary order to multi-year tariff order 2024. NEC approved the tariff, its realignment, and service delivery commitment for Band A electricity consumers to ensure the sustainability and viability of distribution companies and the entire electricity sector. Against the backdrop of inflationary pressures characterized by rising food prices, and declining purchasing power. The hike in electricity tariff has raised concerns among Nigerians who believe this will further compound the economic challenges facing the country. According to some experts' opinion, uh, the interplay between the hike in electricity prices and inflationary pressure has far-reaching implications not only for individual households and businesses, but also for broader macroeconomic environment. Let's put some perspective to some of these contending issues. And I'm being joined live from the United Kingdom, our Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Budget, Mr. Olusion Onigbinde. It's great to have you start the week with us. And Mr. Onigbinde, thank you for your time. It's a whole pleasure. To, it's a pleasure being on this program today. Thank you so much. Well, I, I, I like to start this way. A lot of reforms about the federal government, which mm. is obviously having impact on the masses and a lot of comments from here and there the most recent is the high on electricity tariff which now is about uh, 300 percent higher uh, than what we used to have before now uh, my question really would be do you think plans are really on ground to cushion the effect of the negative impact of some of these policies of government at this strategic time um, I don't think so, uh, that their plans are in here. Uh, and the fundamental plan should have been the increase in a minimum wage. Um, and we know that fuel price has been increased for around 10 months now. Um, the federal government has had enough time to sit down with the Nigerian Labour Congress and other key stakeholders to decide on what the new minimum wage should look like. And that has not been done. And so we've had this award system, which is sometimes sounds very new to me, a wage award system. Some of some form of socialism, you know, in a way. I mean, someone who's earning 400000 
you pay the person for thirty-five thousand. Someone who's earning fifty thousand, you pay the person eighty-five thousand. You just you know equalize benefit in that without graduating them. I don't think that is in the right mindset because that's not what it used to be. So the acceleration of the minimum wage that should have happened, you know, during immediately the uh, fuel prices were increased. All of that has not happened as it should be. Um, then we also now have other policies that have now taken shape, such as the um, the intention to um, to liberalise the FX market or to reduce parity between the parallel market and the official market in court. And that is also has had an effect. We have, we have seen um, escalating inflation, even though I think in recent times we've seen a little retreat in the prices. It has not gone back to the to where it was where it was before, but you know, what has been uh, is a backward shift in the prices. So um, I think, uh, in a way, uh, that has also not been addressed. We've had palliative here and there. We've had um, agricultural grains being reduced and just being given out to people. But nothing holistic has been created, which should have started from the exchange, um, from the minimum wage um, discussion. And now we now have the electricity tariff. You know, and I think um, you know it doesn't affect the whole lot of Nigerians. If I was, I also found out today that I'm within the band B, so um, I figured out that there are very few Nigerians who are in the band A. But I still have challenges uh, with that um, in some sort of way. Um, honestly, the exchange, the um, exchange rate devaluation has affected the the subsidy t- uh, electricity subsidy that has been given out over. The last few months so it's not just because nigeria started consuming more electricity or because gas prices went much more higher it's because the devaluation of the currency let's not forget that gas is priced also in dollars so if a lot of subsidy that is going to the uh, the producers of gas and the and the jenkos is just because of the the nigerian government has to pay much more money um, to this organization or to these institutions so um, and now, would you not put that burden up? Would you put that burden up on average Nigerians in some way? Um, I, I don't think that this is the silver bullet to the institution. I understand what the government is trying to do is that we are open to liberalizing this market so that we can find uh, investments can come in, especially in the gas gathering and the gas transportation component of this work. Um, but I, I don't think uh, that is a sufficient framework for that to happen. There are a lot more things that the government can do to make sure that uh, those things get to happen at the end of the day. Mm. A beautiful way to start and leading me to my next question, which is attracting foreign investors, which remains on the front burner of President Bola Tinumbu. Uh, some say these reforms are necessary to help bring in these guys and let them bring in the FBI's the FDIs, they want to repatriate their funds, they want an open market, they want to be sure that they can get their monies back where you put your money, you want profit, and of course, your money. So, do you think that some of these reforms would help attract the needed investments in Nigeria? Yeah, thanks so much. And it depends on the kind of investment we are looking for. If we are looking for foreign portfolio investment, I think we are doing enough to attract foreign portfolio investment. We put rate at 21%. Um, the CBN is open to enter into some carry contracts with some of these institutions. So it's, it's very clear that CBN is open to say we need the FPIs. I also need to rain on uh, on loose uh, monetary environment. So it's it's issued um, instruments at a very, very uh, high rate, high, high rate around 21 22% to be able to mop up cash or mop up funds within the economy. Um, I think that is enough attraction. It's just that we are in a, the global macroeconomic environment is not in the right place right now. Um, as we know, um, there's been a lot of interest to the Fed rate as not helping any country, as not helping any environment, because a lot of people have found it more attractive to invest up their money right there in the United States. Um, we also, also know that a whole of uncertainty between Russia and China and, and, and Ukraine, between the, what is happening in the Middle East, between China and the US, is also have also restrained the flow of uh, global capital, global investment flow. So 
we'll get a little bit. We'll get, like we have been getting, some has been recorded in recent years, uh, recent months, we will get, but I don't think we should expect like a gush of it. Tap, you know, we should not expect that uh, investment that was have The sticky uh, FDIs, which takes much more time to come in and marinate, I mean, that's the one that would, we would have to do much more than what we are doing. Because we have to create the growth verticals. Where exactly do you want to put money in? Um, we know that we have opportunities in agriculture, yes. We know we have opportunities in solid minerals, yes. We have opportunities in energy, either in the renewable energy or within with the gas framework or the gas value chain. So we should be able to you know, pitch this into prospective investors and get them to bring money in and also be able to now set a new code in terms of ability to repatriate their earnings and their benefits and their profits and all of that. Um, if we don't set those criteria strongly, we will not even be able to profit with whatever D2 is available in the global investment fear currently. So I think uh, what we are doing right now is going to accelerate FPIs, which is already happening. Um, but I think what should be much more clear from the CBN angle is that um, we can't do this all alone. We can't be clapping in one hand. Uh, we need the fiscal side to join in, uh, which is the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Trade and Investment. We need them to bring their own initiatives to board. And we also need some political will from the president himself. And all of that is what can accelerate the FDI that we talk about. Because what we have right now, we will grow an FPI. And then we also know that most of this intervention comes at a cost. Because whatever loans or whatever instrument or securities are being issued by the CBN at this point, they are, they are, it's, it's, at an, it's, at a, it's at a price point. It's at, it's at a rate. So definitely the CPA will pay for those, um, for those rates at, at when the time is due. And so some sort of way you, and once the federal government also wants to borrow, it also borrow at those rates. Um, that would have significant influence on, on debt servicing and fiscal deficit along the way. So it's something that the CBN knows that whatever it's doing right now is not a, is a short term op option. It's cannot be something that can be sustained. Um, if there's any global economic, uh, global macroeconomic uh, shake up in the next few months, the FPIs that you think you have would leave. They would take their bags and walk away. And you are you're left hanging to be able to meet their obligations, maybe not even in an orderly manner, maybe at once. So in some sort of way, it's very important for the CDN also to understand that there are cheaper options to be able to stimulate you know, the environment. And one of the cheapest, one of the cheapest options is just to sell more food oil. We need to optimize our food oil production, and we need to also incentivize non-oil export growth. If you're able to do all those two things, um, I think we will be in a much more steady uh, position to be able to either defend the currency or even have some level of monetary stability. Hmm. Now, let's, let's drift towards um, the youth now. And we know that this government has talked about being focused on empowering the youth. And one of this, uh, the way to do this is the student loan, which we've been talking mm -hmm. about. It's become law. I think President put pen to paper. Well, my question really to you is, do you think this will make the expected impact and help reduce, uh, in quotes, out of school children, children not being able to go to school? Do you think this will encourage more of them to take advantage of the student loan? Yeah, I mean, the student loan program is, is great. And I think, uh, even though I feel like it should be much, much more, I feel like those amounts are still relatively too small. Um, but it's a good start. Um, and it, it's a good plan. But, you know, we apply approaches, you know, in an ad hoc way when we should do things in a more holistic manner, in a more comprehensive manner. The issues that ail our education system is beyond student loan. You know, if we want to give autonomy to the universities, let's be honest about that. If we want to also look at the quality of teaching and how quality of infrastructure in there, let's be honest about that and see that we are doing the right things because um, it takes a quality, the quality of learning and also the 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 the, the productivity from from the students. I mean, from when they become graduate. What does that look like? So that people are able to pay back some of these loans. See, people don't see an opportunity to leave university and be able to earn well and be able to now, you know, be able to pay back some of this money. You know, they might not be willing to take it. So it's something that we have to be much more clear about. That why are we giving this student loan? Are we raising the the, the, the price for education? 
for the tuition at the institutional level and, and if we're increasing those tuition what ex what value are the students getting and what opportunities exist in the economy to be able to absorb them so that they can pay back some of those loans most of the environments that we are trying to copy uh, like in the us and in the uk where there are student loans available there is you know a framework for them to pay back there is an opportunity economic opportunity for prospect for them a lot of tax rebates and discounts that are given to, to organizations for, for fresh graduate hires that a whole lot of companies latch upon to be able to you know to do all of these things to be able to give people at least the ground level experience so they can they can build upon. So it's something that has to be has to be some holistic approach to all of these things. Nigeria is in a state where a lot of things have to run at once. If we give student loan and we do not fix the quality of education we receive and we do not ensure that you know, the infrastructure and also the productivity level and, and for the graduates is, is, is assured to some extent. And we can, we know that some of this might just not work as it should work. But I commend the effort, but I just feel like the issues are bigger than, than the student loan at this moment. Now, almost finally, interest rates have been increased back to back. Uh, you talked about that uh, in your earlier submission, talking about the handshake between the monetary side, of course, and the fiscal side, which everybody has identified as the way to go. But this increase in rates, do you think it can rain in on inflation, considering our peculiarity as a country? And what also is the implication for lending from banks so that Nigerians can really understand what 24.75% means when you, you know, as NPR rates, when you want to borrow? I mean, it's it's a bit challenging because I mean, yes, NPR of twenty four point seven five percent is it's very high, and that puts prime lending rates above thirty percent, thirty two percent. By the time you adjust for administrative transaction costs, you might go as high as thirty five percent. It's a dangerous terrain to be. It's not the best of times to be an entrepreneur, just because. CBN is saying there's a risk free rate of twenty four point seven five percent. There's a flaw. You know, um, it's 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 worrisome, and I think it's the challenge with economics. You can't eat your cake and have it, um, it which means that definitely you would. I mean, this is, I and mean, you can't blame this government solely for it. But you can blame them that you know when this when the previous government was embarking on a loose fiscal uh, and monetary supply into the economy, um, nobody, a lot of NGOs, non profit like us, we spoke against it. And when the deficit was widening beyond measure, we spoke against it. But we didn't get enough support from political actors, most of who are the beneficiaries um, of that system. We didn't get any support. Now we have to work back all of those funds. We have to take those monies out of the economy and, and, and so that we can rein in on, on, on inflation. Number one, I don't think that's the silver bullet to inflation, but I think the CBN is doing what it can Within its own powers, it's raised interest rates. Um, it's trying to find stability in the exchange rate market. So, whatever to the CBN can apply, you know, in terms of uh, stabilizing the environment, they are doing that. It's a fiscal side that also needs to step up, you know, and it's stepping up starts from the budget. If there are different items in the budget that uh, would expand our deficit and they have no meaning and they have no value or no use to the citizens. This is the time to embark on a very vigorous fiscal efficiency uh, program. You know, projects that are really important, that are really necessary to improve the lives of citizens. That's what we should be funded, not things that only speak to political objective or political use of, of citizens. So this is the time for the fiscal side to step up because the monetary side is doing what it can. But by the time we start releasing um, allocations for contractors and we start you know, expanding more from the fiscal side and we start raising more money and we start lose money starts coming from the angle. What you see is that some of this effort by the CBN comes into futility or comes into nullity. So CBN cannot fight inflation alone. It could only do its own part, which I think they are doing. I think there were some challenges in the beginning, um, but right now I think things are beginning to shape up from that angle um, in, in some sort of way. And they made it clear that they will not do lose developing finance. I think it's, a, it's something that is highly well work. But at the end of the day, uh, it's not going to be helpful to the private entrepreneurs who are trying to borrow in this market. This is why also 
you know, some concessionary development finance is actually necessary for the SMEs um, as much as possible. And if the CDN and the banks are going to go over it again and ensure that it is thrown through a much more structured framework, I think they should go ahead and do that because at 30, 30 to 35 percent, um, we are not going to stimulate this, this, the small uh, scale uh, business environment in that way. Maybe it's time for the CDN to step up and and work with the fiscal side and, and work with the banking industry to find some concessionary loans uh, for the small business environment. Interesting conversation. In one minute, uh, before I let you go, I'd just like you to give your outlook, an overview, despite all of these challenges. I know that could take some time, but let's just be punchy about it. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if we take a look at the government so far, I mean, we have, I mean, it's been, um, there's been challenges. Um, but number one, you have to respect their courage if yeah. you want to try. Mm. Um, number, so that is something that I take. Number two, I think a lot of thought, a lot of scenario plan did not go to some of the decisions that were being made. Um, one thing is that, for example, the removal of the first subsidy, some of the decisions should have been accompanied with some framework to ameliorate the crisis. There are social costs to some of these decisions. And I don't think the government uh, have thought through those social implications of the problem. It moves to a subsidy. Uh, good, you are flirting with inflation. And I think that came in a very sporadic way. So definitely the government has still not addressed, you know, has not addressed mass transit programs, has still not addressed the minimum wage framework, has still not addressed food inflation as it should be. So it's something that the a lot of decisions are taking without properly analyzing the social cost. That also even comes with the CBN. They wanted to run down an open-ended float. They tried it. They see that it's not going to work. You know, now we're now in a situation where we now you know we understand that retail environment needs a bit of liquidity. I'm not a fan of BDCs, but I figured out that they are permanent or somehow a feature in our in our exchange rate framework. So CBN is providing some liquidity to them because I don't. Personally, I don't think the, the parallel market is that deep. It's not a huge market. But I think it's, it's a market with, that sets a lot of perception for the environment. So if the CBN is doing what it's doing now with the intervention through the, through the PDCs, I think in some sort of way they will achieve some of those convergence that they need um, at the end of it. But like I said, either you're increasing rates, uh, either you're mopping up money from the economy, either you're trying to attract FPIs, that you are telling banks to also recapitalize, which is also a way for you to attract FPIs and bring investment to the country and also more up money into the environment. All of that kind of work, we should also think heavily about the social cost of those decisions. That's why I feel all of that is changing the lending environment beyond what an entrepreneur can afford. The CBN also has to be honest and to be humane to find solutions around that. And I think the CBN has been clear that they won't do that by themselves. The federal government also should come forward and, and do these things by itself because the CBN in the last government was like all things to everything. You know, now they want to be more focused on their role, mm -hmm. which is about price stability. That's the primary role of the Nigerian, uh, Niger the Central Bank of Nigeria, price stability. And I think. Uh, if they continue in this framework, they will do. They're doing well, but the fiscal side needs to also step up. Well. Interesting, Mr. Olusho Onigbide, co-founder, CEO of Budget. Thank you so much for joining us on the program today. We appreciate this. Do enjoy the rest of your day and your week. And you have a wonderful one. Too. Thank you. Yeah. All right, then. Interesting conversation. But against that backdrop, we'll continue the conversation and we'll examine the state of Nigeria's foreign exchange market and the role of the BDCs. Yes, a lot is happening. The president of the Association of Blue Distant Operators of Nigeria, Alaji Aminu Gwadabe, is live in the studio for us to continue this conversation after this break. This is Business Nigeria. Stay with us. The conversation continues.
Prince Abiola Joseph and a 5 million era winner in the UBA Super Saver Draw. Oti Dodo, King Pulongwe, Fawe Yomi, Lati Limokwe, Osi, Ibatiri, Iwala Woli Didi, Ibiti Wawo Lero, Wale Rilo, Iwala Wagbambe, but ki oma ni pe awon se meji ni pati uba ta ona ba ti ri nkan ti uba se fun ngati mi o dero o ma je ka won gan kinu won dun la de san poya e je ka ba ri bi duwo po o le jaana mo ni lucky dollar my name is abiodo joseph adura mi ba i drive commercial bus in lagos every week Green Angle, in partnership with World Aid, will bring you a documentary series on environmental issues affecting Nigeria's amazing biodiversity, from climate change, air pollution, and wildlife conservation. We will be traveling across Nigeria to give you on the ground report of the issues affecting our environment. It airs every Saturday at 4 30 p.m., only on TVC News. All right, thank you so much for staying with us. Nigeria's foreign exchange market plays a crucial role in the country's economic landscape, serving as a critical channel for international trade, investment, and financial transactions. However, the market has been grappling with various challenges, including speculations, infractions, hoarding, amongst others. In response to these challenges, the CBN recently implemented various policies aimed at stabilizing the exchange rate, including the sales of dollar operations in the market. But what really is the state of the FX market? It's a big question waiting for answer. I must tell you, I have the right person in the house to talk about this this Monday afternoon. The president of the Association of Blue Dishange Operators of Nigeria. Yes. Thank you so much. It's good to see you again. Good afternoon. Yes, and happy Ramadan as we prepare for the yeah, uh, victory very soon, yeah. the celebration. Yeah, I think by tomorrow. Yes. I'm going to have the yeah, declared tomorrow. Tuesday and Wednesday. But let's talk about the dollars that we use. So anyway, we are a naira spending country. But really, what is the true state of the market? We see that one way or the other, naira is getting strength. What is happening? Tell us practically. In fact, uh, it's like a tsunami. It's a moving wave. It's a, a repetitive price pattern analysis, faster than expected. Mm. Uh, Nera have gained over 800 Nera to a dollar as we speak, under one month from average high of 1,915 to 1,210 as we speak in the open market uh, structure. Uh, this is a manifestation of some of the policies you have mentioned, payment of backlog, uh, securities in terms of uh, uh, bills, I mean bonds and treasury bills uh, that have attracted a lot of uh, subscriptions. Okay. And also uh, we have seen some increments in uh, production of uh, crude oil. So public confidence and investors' confidence because most of the treasury bills that were issued by the central bank are oversubscribed okay uh, yes for yes. investors so that uh, also reflects uh, return of uh, foreign investors confidence, confidence so, yes. which is uh, lacking and then the most important one all these other illegal activities behavior economic behavior that you have mentioned uh, holding uh, round tripping because what we are seeing now there is no even incentive for you to down trip. Mm. That is the extent of the manifestation of market reality. The open market is even cheaper than what the central bank is selling to the bureau of the chain. So tell me, where is the, where is the, the opportunity incentive? to round trip? So it, the, the, the majors have completely killed that behavior of round tripping. No incentive at all. And that on its own is another uh, drive for more especially operators mm. to, to at least want to attempt to divert the public allocation, you know, to 
the other market. The market. So that incentive have, have completely been removed. Also, the anxiety of a uh, seller market, whereby it's uh, only uh, you know people that are selling that have the position that are selling at whatever price discrimination they like. That has also been wiped out because it's, what we're seeing is a dumping scenario. Daily, people are bringing out what they have due to lack of, uh, uh, due to anxiety when they were rushing to buy. buy. Now, it's, it's not happening. People are, instead of coming to demand, is coming to sell. So, uh, that have also affected the market. Also, uh, just today, the CBN have also lowered their rate to the bill yes. exchange to 1,101 to a dollar plus 1.5%. So that uh, come to say about 1,117 to uh, 0.5 to a dollar, which is lower now than the doc undocumented market. Now in the market, the undocumented market is doing 1,210. So you can see there is about 30 Naira gap, which will enable the BDC. It will now be an incentive uh, for the client of the BDC. Instead of them to patronize the undocumented market, they will now come to BDC because there is an incentive. When they come to the BDC, they will get it cheaper by 30, 40 Naira compared okay. to the uh, market. And you know, don't forget there are a lot of uh, conditionalities. Uh, it's not that you just come and you give me cash. It's not a cash transaction. The payments you are making to me, if you are buying this dollar, must come from your account. And that name in your account must also correlate with the name in your international passport, with the name in your own visa. So it's pretty tight for you to say you want sharp to, practice. Yeah, to do sharp practices. So... Uh, in general, I think uh, we've seen the achievement of the unification of uh, exchange rate. There is convergence, you know. Uh, this is, in 15 years, the first time that we have seen whereby even the parallel market rate is cheaper than the official market rate. So we are delighted. At least uh, prices of commodities have started also reflecting in terms of uh, air tickets uh, is coming down. Also, prices like uh, daily needs, Indomie. I buy Indomie for my daughter. His carton of Indomie before is 14,000. Now it's about 9,000. Wow. So, so we're we starting seen, to see that see impact. Some, yeah. That is something that is very important, Alaji, right. because Nigerians, we believe that when prices go up, it rarely comes down. That is the fear of everyone. Yeah. You, know? you see, there are so many uh, factors in determining price. Mm, true. Uh, you know, so uh, it's not only uh, the, the estimate, dollar, yes, transportation, you know, so infrastructure, the raw material. So that comes into play. However, uh, the Nigeria is an import-dependent country. Yes. Most of the inflation we have, they are imported in, in inflation. Mm. Uh, yeah. So that is to say that yes the appreciation of your uh, local currency should. It's, a, uh, it's not a rocket science because it's a question of demand and supply rule. So if that content of foreign exchange is being uh, lowered down, mm -hmm. definitely a manufacturer should be seen to also lower his own prices. Unfortunately, what we have been seeing is like, you know, most of the manufacturing sector, uh, they are more like dominated by foreign players um, foreign players have a way of uh, some sharp practices uh, in terms of complying. So I think the Consumer Protection Agency now should wake up to ensure that those uh, 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 manufacturers are not taking advantage since there is also a relief for them now. So the government should look into that so that people will not be left to... Uh, people that will be exploiting them. I think that is very important, and the FCCPC will be listening to us, and I think there's a press release with regards to that. Now, let's look at your margin. We see CBN saying not, don't sell exceeding 1.5% above the purchasing price. Right. Can you shed more light on this and how this is impacting business? You see, uh, the volatility in a market, I said it here before, is like a run of water, uh, erosion. 
if you don't direct it, it will direct itself. True. Uh, yeah. So, yes, I quite uh, agree with open market, willing buyer, willing seller, no cap rate. But uh, don't forget, this is uh, allocation, this is an intervention. So the CBA is trying to put a band. Uh, yes, we will sell this money to you at 1,101, but this is the maximum you can sell. So. 1.5% uh, of 1,101 comes to about one, I mean, comes to about 15 Naira, uh, they are about 15, 16 Naira. They are about 1.5% margin. Mm -hmm. So plus 1,101 will give you 1,117.525. So no any uh, BDC that buy this money at this rate should sell this money at more than 1,117.52. But it's a competitive market. Part of what we have seen is market efficiency. Let me give you an example. Go ahead. The money I bought last uh, two weeks, I bought it at 1,301. Unexpectedly, I mean 1,251. Unexpectedly, the rate came down even to uh, the, the open market rate, the undocumented market rate, came to about 1,240. And I bought it at 1,251. So that's a shortage already. Uh, of course, I made a loss. So, but uh, you see, I'm a businessman. Mm. Uh, I have to even sell lower than even my cost price, yeah. not even uh, working on the profit margin. Mm. So, the same scenario is market efficiency now we are seeing. Some of us may not even wait to make up to that one. Yeah, that one. Percent. Yes. I can, yes. I see one percent. See one percent. I want to, and I, I want to close. Volume. Yeah, I want to close. True. And make sure. It's turnover. Mm. It's not, yeah, margin is good because of a uh, higher cost of uh, operations and st uh, stuff like that. But it will enhance market efficiency. It will enhance liquidity. Like I said, there is no incentive now for you to buy the money to say, let me go and take it to another market that will give me higher profit. There is no incentive. Those people that are coming because of anxiety, lack of confidence, the Nera has no value. You can't see them now. So what we are seeing now is a proper and professional practice. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. Uh, now, I also want us to take us through uh, the dollar allocation thing. Sometimes they don't meet deadlines. Maybe you pay before you, you are issued. It, 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 the price has changed again. So yeah, how can that be automated? That can be you, seamless. You see, yeah, very, very important. On our part as an association, yes. we are coming up with uh, automating the entire system. Good. Which we want to recommend to the central bank. From disbursement, it will capture right from the time you collected that money. It will automate it. Your yeah, utilization. We follow each and every dime you collected. How do you sell it? Online, real time. Also, it will enable you to prepare reports mm. because this is part of the obligation. It's not only you go and collect money and sell. The major work, your obligations, yes. you have to at least uh, comply with anti money laundering uh, mm. and, uh, and terrorism financing, anti terrorism financing majors. You have to put them, you have to do record keeping. You have to know your customer. So also the final leg is to make all this automation. We do the KYC at the back end. Mm. Uh, to verify your BVN, uh, verify your BVN, it will verify even your passport. We are trying to integrate also uh, tickets so that we can see the genuineness of that passport. So very soon uh, we unveil that and then it will enable you to render your returns. Because what we are seeing now is supposed to be a uh, a spot uh, transaction, okay. not a forward transaction. Also with the uh, offer of uh, offer and acceptance rule. So it's not uh, uh, it's not funny. Uh, you pay your money like for say for a spot transaction. Max spot transaction is forty eight hours. So within forty eight hours, you are expected by the time you uh, you know uh, make uh, pay out your own error, you should be able to receive that dollar. But uh, we are aware also a lot of changes have been taking place in the central bank. New people are doing managing this thing. So there is that caution. Yeah, everyone of, is taking of, it. It's uh, our time. time. Yeah, so <laughs> I know over time 
those we are also not be seen again. So m moving forward, what sort of relationship are we expecting between the CBN and APCON, of course, the Broad Exchange Operators? And do you see us sustaining this gain moving forward if we continue at this pace? Uh, let me use this medium to announce one of our greatest plans to Nigeria. And that greatest plan is for anybody that is trading in foreign exchange to come under the association of Bureau de Change. Wow. That is our objective. We are working on that. Good. We are talking to all stakeholders. The central bank have, uh, out of their own magnanimity, the governments have reconsidered us and have recalled us. So, as good citizens of this country, we are working 24 7 to see that we have a united market whereby we can ensure discipline, we can ensure monitoring, mm. we can ensure transaction so that we clean, we purge our system. We have a lot of uh, citizens.